Welcome to Snoozecast, the podcast designed to help you fall asleep. Find us on snoozecast.com and follow us on Instagram at snoozecast to find behind the scenes content. If you enjoy our show, please write a review on the Apple Podcast app. Also, share us with a friend. This episode is brought to you by our Patreon supporters and by Window Gazing. Tonight, we'll read excerpts from the Ladies' Book of Etiquette and Manual of Politeness, written in 1860 by Florence Hartley. The excerpts will include Conduct in the Street and Polite Deportment and Good Habits. The opening excerpt regarding conduct in the street refers to omnibuses. These were large, horse-drawn carriages used for public transportation in the late 1800s. Hartley was a Victorian-era writer covering topics of etiquette and needlework. She was also an advocate for women's health. If you enjoy this episode... Be sure to check out our episode of excerpts from this title including How to Behave at a Hotel and Places of Amusement. That episode aired on June 21st, 2019. Let's get cozy. Close your eyes. Relax your body into the softness of your bed. Now, take a few deep breaths. Conduct in the street. A lady's conduct is never so entirely at the mercy of critics, because never so public, as when she is in the street. Her dress, carriage, walk, will all be exposed to notice. Every passerby will look at her, if it's only for a glance. Every unladylike action will be marked, and in no position will be a dignified, ladylike deportment more certain to command respect. Let me start with you upon your promenade, my friend. First, your dress. Not that scarlet shawl with a green dress, I beg. And, oh, spare my nerves. You are not so insane as to put on a blue bonnet. That's right. If you wish to wear the green dress, don a black shawl, and that white bonnet will do very well. One rule you must lay down with regard to a walking dress. It must never be conspicuous. Let the material be rich, if you will. The set of each garment faultless. Half collar and sleeves snowy white and wear neatly fitting, whole, clean gloves and boots. Every detail may be scrupulously attended to, but let the whole effect be quiet and modest. Wear a little of one bright color, if you will, but not more than one. Let each part of the dress harmonize with all the rest. Avoid the extreme of fashion, and let the dress suit you. Wear what is becoming to yourself, 
and only bow to fashion enough to avoid eccentricity. Wear no jewelry in the street, excepting your watch and brooch. Jewelry is only suited for full evening dress, when all the other details unite to set it off. If it is real, it is too valuable to risk losing in the street, and if it is not real, no lady should wear it. What are you doing? Sucking the head of your parasol? Have you not breakfasted? Take that piece of ivory from your mouth. To suck it is unladylike, and let me tell you, excessively unbecoming. Rosy lips and pearly teeth can be put to better use. Why did you not dress before you came out? Now your bonnet strings, and now your collar. Pray arrange your dress before you leave the house. Nothing looks worse than to see a lady fussing over her dress in the street. Take a few moments before in your dressing room, and so arrange your dress that you will not need to think about it again whilst you are out. You're not chasing anybody. Walk slowly, gracefully. Oh, do not drag one foot after the other as if you were fast asleep. Set down the foot lightly, but at the same time firmly. Now, carry your head up. Not so. You hang it down as if you feared to look at anyone in the face. Nay, that's the other extreme now. Now you look like a drill major on parade. So, that is the medium. Erect, yet, at the same time, easy and elegant. Now, my friend, do not swing your arms. You don't know what to do with them. Your parasol takes one hand. Hold your dress up a little with the other. Not so. No lady should raise her dress above the ankle. Take care. Don't drag your dress through the mud puddle. Worse and worse. If you take hold of your dress on both sides in that way and drag it up so high, so. Raise it just above the boot, all around, easily, letting it fall again in the old folds. Don't shake it down. It will fall back of itself. Stop. Don't you see there is a carriage coming? Do you want to be thrown down by the horses? You can run across. Very ladylike indeed. Surely nothing can be more ungraceful than to see a lady shuffle and run across a street. Wait until the way is clear, and then walk slowly across. Do not try to raise your skirts. It is better to soil them. You were very foolish to wear white skirts this muddy day. They are easily washed, and you cannot raise all. You will surely be awkward in making the attempt, and probably fail, in spite of your efforts. True, they will be badly soiled, and you will expose this when you raise the dress. But the state of the streets must be seen by all who see your share of the dirt, and they will apologize for your untidy appearance in a language distinctly understood. Always hold an umbrella or parasol so that it will clear your bonnet and leave the space before your face open that you may see your way clearly. If you are ever caught in a shower and meet a gentleman friend who offers an umbrella, accept it if he will accompany you to your destination but do not deprive him of it if he is not able to join you. Should he insist, 
Return it to his house or store the instant you reach home with a note of thanks. If a stranger offers you the same services, decline it positively but courteously, at the same time thanking him. Never stop to speak to a gentleman in the street. If you have anything important to say to him, allow him to join and walk with you, but do not stop. It is best to follow the same rule with regard to ladies and either walk with them or invite them to walk with you instead of stopping to talk. A lady who desires to pay strict regard to etiquette will not stop to gaze in at the shop windows. It looks countrified. If she is alone, it looks as if she were waiting for someone. And if she is not alone, she is victimizing someone else to satisfy her curiosity. Remember that in meeting your gentleman friends, it is your duty to speak first. Therefore, do not cut them by waiting to be recognized. Be sure, however, that they see you before you bow or you place yourself in the awkward position of having your bow pass unreturned. You are not expected to recognize any friend on the opposite side of the street. Even if you see them, do not bow. In the street, a lady takes the arm of a relative, her engaged lover or husband, but of no other gentleman, unless the streets are slippery or in the evening. When a lady walks with two gentlemen, she should endeavor to divide her attention and remarks equally between them. If a gentleman, although a stranger, offers his hand to assist you in leaving a carriage, omnibus, or to aid you in crossing where it is wet or muddy, accept his civility, thank him bow, and pass on. If you wish to take an omnibus or car, see that it is not already full. If it is, do not get in. You will annoy others and be uncomfortable yourself. It is best to carry change to pay car or omnibus fare as you keep others waiting whilst the driver is making change, and it is apt to fall into the straw when passing from one hand to another. If a gentleman gives you his seat, hands your fare, or offers you any such attention, thank him. It is not countrified, it is ladylike. If you do not speak, bow. Walk slowly. Do not turn your head to the right or left unless you wish to walk that way and avoid any gesture or word that will attract attention. Make no remarks upon those who pass you while there is even a possibility that they may hear you. Never stare at anyone even if they have peculiarities which make them objects of remark. In taking your place in an omnibus or car, do so quietly and then sit perfectly still. Do not change your place or move restlessly. Make room for others if you see that the opposite side is full. If you walk with a gentleman, when he reaches your door, 
invite him in. But if he declines, do not urge him. If you are returning from a ball or party, and the hour is very late, or an early one, you are not bound in politeness to invite your escort to enter. The hour will be your apology for omitting the ceremony. Polite Deportment and Good Habits Lord Chesterfield says, Good sense and good nature suggest civility in general. There are a thousand little delicacies which are established only by custom. It is the knowledge and practice of such little delicacies which constitutes the greatest charm of society. Manner may be, and, in most cases, probably is, the cloak of the heart. This cloak may be used to cover defects, but is it not better so to conceal these defects than to flaunt and parade them in the eyes of all whom we may meet? Many persons plead a love of truth as an apology for rough manners, as if truth was never gentle and kind, but always harsh, morose, and forbidding. Surely, good manners and a good conscience are no more inconsistent with each other than beauty and innocence, which are strikingly akin and always look the better for companionship. Roughness and honesty are indeed sometimes found together in the same person, but he is a poor judge of human nature who takes ill manners to be a guarantee of character. Some persons object to politeness, that its language is unmeaning and false, but this is easily answered. A lie is not locked up in a phrase, but must exist, if at all, in the mind of the speaker. In the ordinary compliments of civilized life, there is no intention to deceive, and consequently no falsehood. Polite language is pleasant to the ear and soothing to the heart, while rough words are just the reverse, and if not the product of ill temper, are very apt to produce it. The plainest of truths, let it be remembered, can be conveyed in civil speech, while the most malignant lies may find utterance, and often do, in the language of the fish market. Many ladies say, Oh, I'm perfectly frank and outspoken. I never stop to mince words. Or, There is no affectation about me. All my actions are perfectly natural. And, Upon the ground of frankness, will insult and wound by rude language, and defend awkwardness by the plea of natural manners. If nature has not invested you with all the virtues which may be desirable in a lady, do not make your faults more conspicuous and at all times. Assume a virtue if you have it not and you will, in time, by imitation, acquire it. By endeavoring to appear generous, disinterested, self-sacrificing, and friendly, the opposite passions will be brought into subjection, first in the manner, afterwards in the heart, it is not the desire to deceive, but the desire to please, 
which will dictate such a course. When you hear one who pretends to be a lady boast that she is rough, capricious, and gluttonous, you may feel sure that she has never tried to conquer these faults, or she would be ashamed, not proud of them. The way to make yourself pleasing to others is to show that you care for them. The whole world is like the miller at Mansfield, who cared for nobody. No, not he, because nobody cared for him. And the whole world will serve you so if you give them the same cause. Let everyone, therefore, see that you do care for them by showing them what Stern so happily calls the small, sweet courtesies of life, those courtesies in which there is no parade, whose voice is too still to tease, and which manifest themselves by tender and affectionate looks and little kind acts of attention, giving others the preference in every little enjoyment at the table, in the field, walking, sitting, or standing. Thus, the first rule for a graceful manner is unselfish consideration of others. By endeavoring to acquire the habit of politeness, it will soon become familiar and sit on you with ease if not with elegance. Let it never be forgotten that genuine politeness is a great fosterer of family love. It allays accidental irritation by preventing harsh retorts and rude contradictions. It softens the boisterous, stimulates the indolent, suppresses selfishness, and by forming a habit of consideration for others, harmonizes the whole. Politeness begets politeness, and brothers may be easily won by it to leave off the rude ways they bring home from school or college Sisters ought never to receive any little attention without thanking them for it, never to ask a favor of them but in courteous terms, never to reply to their questions in monosyllables, and they will soon be ashamed to do such things themselves. The example ought to be laid under contribution to convince them that no one can have really good manners abroad who is not habitually polite at home. You must carry your good manners everywhere with you. It is not a thing that can be laid aside and put on at pleasure. True politeness is uniformly disinterested in trifles, accompanied by the calm self-possession which belongs to a noble simplicity of purpose. And this must be the effect of a spirit running through all you do, or say, or think, and unless you cultivate it and exercise it upon all occasions and towards all persons, it will never be a part of yourself. It is not an art to be paraded upon public occasions and neglected in everyday duties, nor should it like a ball dress, 
be carefully laid aside at home, trimmed, ornamented, and worn only when out. Let it come out into every thought, and it will show forth in every action. Let it be the rule in the homeliest duties, and then it will set easily when in public, not in a stiff manner, like a garment, seldom worn. I wish it were possible to convince every woman that politeness is a most excellent good quality, that it is a necessary ingredient in social comfort and a capital assistant to actual prosperity. Like most good things, however, the word politeness is often misunderstood and misapplied, and before urging the practical use of that which it represents, it may be necessary to say what it means and what it does not mean. Politeness is not hypocrisy, cold-heartedness, or unkindness in disguise. There are persons who can smile upon a victim and talk smoothly while they injure, deceive, or betray, and they will take credit to themselves that all has been done with the utmost politeness, that every tone, look, and action has been in perfect keeping with the rules of good breeding. The words of their mouth are smoother than butter, but war is in their heart. Their words are softer than oil, yet are they drawn swords. Perish forever and ever such spurious politeness as this. Politeness is not servility. If it were so, a Russian serf would be a model of politeness. It is very possible for persons to be very cringing and obsequious without a single atom of politeness, and it often happens that men of the most sturdy independence of character are essentially polite in all their words, actions, and feelings. It were well for this to be fully understood. For many people will abstain from acts of real politeness and even of common civility for fear of damaging their fancied independence. True politeness, as I understand it, is kindness and courtesy of feeling brought into everyday exercise. It comprehends hearty goodwill towards everybody, thorough and constant good humor, an easy deportment, and obliging manners. Every person who cultivates such feelings and takes no pains to conceal them will necessarily be polite, though she may not exactly know it, while, on the other hand, a woman essentially morose, whatever may be her pretensions, must be very far from truly polite. It's very true there that there are those whose position in society compels them to observe certain rules of etiquette which pass for politeness. They bow or curtsy with a decent grace. 
shake hands with the precise degree of vigor which the circumstances of the case require. Speak just at the right time and in the required manner and smile with elegant propriety. Not a tone, look, or gesture is out of place. Not a habit indulged which etiquette forbids. And yet, there will be wanting, after all, the secret charm of sincerity and heart kindness, which those outward signs are intended to represent, and wanting which we have only the form without the essence of politeness. Let me recommend, therefore, far beyond all the rules ever penned by teachers of etiquette, the cultivation of kind and loving feelings. Throw your whole soul into the lesson and you will advance rapidly towards the perfection of politeness. For, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. And the movements of your form and the words you utter will follow faithfully the hidden springs of action within. It is that which imparts ease and confidence to our manners and impels us for our own sake as well as for the sake of others to behave becomingly as intelligent beings. It is a want of true politeness that introduces the discord and confusion which too often make our happy homes unhappy. A little consideration for the feelings of those whom we are bound to love and cherish, and a little sacrifice of our own wills would, in multitudes of instances, make all the difference between alienation and growing affection. The principle of genuine politeness would accomplish this, and what a pity it is that those whose only spring of rational enjoyment is to be found at home should miss that enjoyment by a disregard of little things which, after all, make up the sum of human existence. What a large amount of actual discomfort in domestic life would be prevented if all children were trained, both by precept and example, to the practice of common politeness if they were taught to speak respectfully to parents and brothers and sisters, to friends, neighbors, and strangers, what bawlings and snarlings would be stilled? If their behavior within doors, and especially at the table, were regulated by a few of the common rules of good breeding, how much natural and proper disgust would be spared if courtesy of demeanor towards all whom they meet in field or highway were instilled. How much more pleasant would be our town travels and our rustic rambles 
Every parent has a personal interest in this matter. And if every parent would but make the needful effort, a great degree of gross incivility and consequent annoyance would soon be swept away from our hearths and homes whilst earnestly endeavoring to acquire true politeness. Avoid that spurious imitation, affectation. It is to genuine politeness what the showy paste is to the pure diamond. It is the offspring of a sickly taste, a deceitful heart, the certain test of affectation in any individual is the looking, speaking, moving, or acting in any way different when in the presence of others, especially those whose opinion we regard and whose approbation we desire, from what we should do in solitude or in the presence of those only whom we disregard or who we think cannot injure or benefit us. The motive for resisting affectation is that it is both unsuccessful and sinful. It always involves a degree of hypocrisy, which is exceedingly offensive in the sight of God, which is generally detected even by men, and which, when detected, exposes its subject to contempt which could never have been excited by the mere absence of any quality or possession, as it is by the false assumption of what is not real. The best cure for affectation is the cultivation, on principle, of every good, virtuous, and friendly habit and feeling not for the sake of being approved or admired, but because it is right in itself and without considering what people will think of it. Thus, a real character will be formed instead of being part assumed and admiration and love will be spontaneously bestowed where they are really deserved. Artificial manners are easily seen through, and the result of such observations, however accomplished and beautiful the object may be, is contempt for such littleness. Many ladies, moving to in good society, will affect a forward, bold manner, very disagreeable to persons of sense. They will tell of their wondrous feats. They will converse in a loud, boisterous tone laugh loudly, sing comic songs, or dashing bravuras in a style only fit for the stage or a gentleman's after-dinner party. They will lay wagers, give broad hints, and then brag of their success in forcing invitations or presents interlard their conversation with slang words or phrases suitable only to the stable or bar room 
And this, they think, is a dashing, fascinating manner. It may be encouraged, admired in their presence by gentlemen, and imitated by younger ladies, but be sure it is looked upon with contempt and disapproval by every one of good sense. Other ladies, taking quite as mistaken a view of real refinement, will affect the most childish timidity, converse only in whispers, move slowly as an invalid, faint at the shortest notice and on the slightest provocation, be easily moved to tears, and profess never to eat, drink, or sleep. This course is as absurd as the other, and much more troublesome, as everybody dreads the scene which will follow any shock to the dear creature's nerves, and will be careful to avoid any dangerous topics. Self-respect and a proper deference for our superiors in age or intellect will be the best safeguards against either a cringing or insolent manner. Without self-respect, you will be apt to be both awkward and bashful, either of which faults are entirely inconsistent with a graceful manner. Be careful that while you have sufficient self-respect to make your manner easy, it does not become arrogance and so engender insolence. Avoid sarcasm. It will, unconsciously to yourself, degenerate into pertness and often downright rudeness. Do not be afraid to speak candidly, but temper candor with courtesy, and never let wit run into that satire that will wound deeply whilst it amuses only slightly.